That Great Business Show, Ireland's best business podcast. ThatGreatBusinessShow.com is brought to you by De Facto Shaving Oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to episode 97 of That Great Business Show, posting on the 22nd of July, 2022. Hi, I'm Conal O'Moran. We're thinking of changing the name of That Great Business Show to That Great Connector Show because the numbers of people who have been in touch about food platform Quega, who joined us on episode 96, has been fantastic. We've sent another group of businesses who want to set up in the United States to John Bordeaux of Advanced CT in Connecticut, including Anne Butterly of Easy Dry. And I was really, really chuffed with the huge, and I do mean huge, positive reaction on LinkedIn to a posting by Ethna Sweeney of Wires Uncrossed because I told her to bring her kids, aged five and seven, into the studio while their mum talked to me about sailing from New Zealand to Mayo and how that led to the setting up of her business, Wires Uncrossed. Of course, the kids were welcome. It's great to imprint kids with enterprise at the earliest age. That Great Business Show, where we do business differently. On this episode, have you ever had a brilliant idea for a TV programme but wondered how to make it a reality? We're joined by Ireland's King of Format TV to explain some facts about TV life. And if transport is in any way part of your business, we'll be talking about the future of the humble truck. We ask our listeners to share, and sharing is what you are doing. Gurv Magi. Thank you. All of the great sites are brought to you thanks to our sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil, the world's best shaving oil, not a beard oil. It's a shaving oil made in Mayo, sold worldwide. De Facto Shaving Oil, smooth as. Now, I have many, many, many interests in life and broadcast is one of them. I could talk to my next guest for the next week and a half about All Matters TV But obviously, we just don't have that time. However, as I'm always looking for business ideas that our listeners, Team GBS, might be able to benefit from, I've decided to concentrate on finding out if it is at all possible to hit it big with that great TV program idea that you have been sitting, thinking about for years. And if so, how much money might you make from it? Larry Bass is the boss of Shinawill, makers of TV programs such as Dancing with the Stars, Last Singer Standing and Home of the Year. But it doesn't end there because Larry has some very, very big worldwide plans for his company. Larry Bass, welcome to that great business show. Thank you, Conal. Great to be here. You are going to make us a fortune because you're going to spill (laughs) the beans, tell us your dark secrets, tell us, is it possible to make millions from TV? It is possible. Uh, I'm, I hope to get there someday myself. Um, you know, there are many stories of formats which have generated uh, multiple millions for the founders. Um, sometimes that's quick and easy, but very, very seldom. And sometimes it's overnight success with a show and it might take 15 or 20 years to land. Um, one of those shows is a show we had to uh, pleasure of producing here in Ireland is a show called Master Chef. Um, when uh, the original creator of that show, a little-known writer, came up with a concept, um, pitched it into uh, part of the BBC. The BBC made the show. It was sort of a magazine-type show on BBC Two for many, many years. Nothing spectacular. Nothing, you know, uh, in any way, the shape or size or scale of the modern day MasterChef Um, and that show was optioned by a company in Australia run by two guys called the Fennessy Brothers, uh, Mark and Carl Fennessy and because Australia is this unique place where you've, the country is the size bigger than Europe but it has a population of only I think 24 million in three or four, five sort of population centres they had to do something different than what they had done in, in the UK on that show. And they supersized it and with the support of an Irish lady, uh, a lady called Beverly McGarvey, who was running the Den uh, 10 network in Australia. And uh, MasterChef, as we know it today, that big sort of reality show was born 
the Hennessy's uh, sold their version of that show um, to Shine, a company that was run by uh, Rupert Murdoch's daughter, Liz Murdoch. Um, Shine is now part of uh, the End the Mall, now Banerjee Group. And that franchise generates a billion dollars a year. Holy God. <laughs> I knew it was big. Yeah. A billion. A billion. That's um, no, my sorry. understanding. So that's, uh, what does a billion mean in that in those terms? Who's getting that cash? Well, look, the, the format rights holder will collect that revenue. And I'm sure there is a number of people sharing in that uh, revenue. Um, the original uh, creator will have a share the various different producers along the way who would have had a, a part in shaping the format from one iteration to the next. The original broadcasters, so the BBC may be in there with a, a slice of it. I really don't know. Um, uh, I didn't see the sort of uh, breakdown. I know, for example, one of the formats that we first did, um, Pop Stars, had a number of uh, owners of the rights, uh, including TVNZ, the original creating network they commissioned it first and then the various producers and distributors all took shares in it and you know that's how these show, show, uh, shows evolve um, you know another show we've made The Apprentice was famously created by Mark Burnett and he had an idea and he decided he wanted to pitch it to one person who he felt is the type of person who could front the idea so he uh, decided to pitch it to a, a then little known uh, New York based developer Donald Trump um, and literally called I'll, the guy I'll add the back got through that. to him boo his his, his <laughs> boo okay um, but they, they he pitched the idea uh, to uh, to Trump um, when Trump got the phone, phone call from Mark he, uh, he said where are you he said well I'm about an hour away from New York he said well come and see me when you get here came in, pitched the idea, they agreed to do it um, and that became a huge success. It's still a very successful show on the BBC um, and in various territories around the world but that format is owned by Mark Burnett. His company is now owned by uh, a VC and um, a big publisher in the US. They were bought out by MGM. MGM has just been bought out by Amazon. So Mark Burnett is the president of MGM, owned by Amazon, and he shares the ownership of The Apprentice with the ex-president of America. They are two gorgeous examples that we can understand. They're the kind of things that must keep you awake at night, just to say, can I have one of those, please? Yeah, but it isn't that easy, you know. So Mark Burnett had the uh, luxury of being a guy who had a track record. He had done a couple of successful shows. So, you know, elevating that idea to the next level he was able to do that. It's taken us a little longer to generate that level of track record. We can still go in now and have those conversations. By you, you mean Shinna Will? Yeah. Uh, we've got a fantastic team. I don't do these productions on my own, that's for sure. And, you know, we created a show with RTE last year called Last Singer Standing. Um, that show is now out um, with a, an international distributor, All Three Media. And we're hoping that we may get some sales of that particular format in well, other countries. Talk to me about, just because I don't know, that format, who sat down, who did you write down with your buyer on a piece of paper, it could work this way and it must look that way. You know, does it tick a lot of boxes? Yeah, so the, the uh, origination of that show, we had done obviously a number of different music-based uh, talent shows in the past. Um, we'd seen what worked, we'd seen what didn't work. We had an idea of doing something. We had a particular idea that we pitched Previously, which didn't fly, didn't get picked up, um, a another young producer came in to work with us on another show, um, Adam uh, McGarry Byrne. He looked at the original idea, he tweaked some elements in it, and we thought, yeah, that, that definitely changes it. And sometimes that's all you need is somebody coming, looking at something with a different um, viewpoint, and it looks and sounds like a different show. We repitched the show. Um, the show then uh, got picked up, and that and you know, if we were doing it again, we would tweak it again because, you know, you've got to always look to be trying to perfect and making things better, never just uh, rinse and repeat. So, what works now? I know that's the impossible question to answer because if you knew that, you'd do it all the time. What does 
a big show, a successful show have that ticks those boxes to get those huge numbers? First of all, you need to be solving a problem for a broadcaster. That's the first thing. You can have the greatest idea in the world, but if you don't have a customer, you have nothing. So that could be trying to find a 25 to 45 year old female audience or something like that. Yeah, it's it could be something, I wish it was as simple as that, but usually it's a case of, you know, trends, you know, broadcasters will follow either international trends or they'll say, look, we don't want an elimination based concept because, you know, you know, we're going through a recession, um, things are difficult enough out there in life. We want something that's uplifting. We want something that's going to uh, entertain rather than put down. So you're taking all of these you know, phrases and you're trying to throw them into the hopper and and distill it down into, oh, that'll mean they might want this type of idea. Um, And, you know, we're constantly, constantly pitching um, ideas. Um, And not just here, we're we're now really looking at focusing on pitching uh, in the US. Um, It's a much bigger market. There's many more customers. You know, RTE been a fantastic customer of ours over a long, long period. Um, And Virgin Media, um, You know, we're working on a show with them. It's just a brand new format. Um, Interestingly, it's in our cooking format. And that show will hopefully launch in their autumn schedule. And we'll look to take that globally. And, you know, so shows, shows can come from, come from anywhere. The, the trick is people come into us, they think they have a good idea. Ah, This is no, this is, this is the meat. And um, I don't want to burst people's bubbles, (laughs) but, but lots of people have good ideas it's not necessarily a good idea that makes the killing format. It's the execution. And um, a good idea simply is not enough. Um, you have to have the production know-how because there are so many so many things along the way that will trip you up into actually getting an idea, you know, from the idea onto paper, from paper to screen. Um, I think the common denominator amongst all of the big and successful formats whether it's shows like Bake Off, MasterChef, The Voice, um, Mass Singer, they all um, share a couple of common traits. A, there's something fresh and different about each of them, even if they are an iteration of a previous show. So a singing talent show, they've been around since vaudeville days. We've always had talent shows for new singers. It's just the next generation. And there will be more. Um I think they all then have what I would call a killer title. If you can't sell it in a title, you really are struggling. So Who Wants to Be a Millionaire is a great title and it works. And believe it or not, it works in many different languages right around the world. Um, The voice, you know, it actually said what it was and what it was different about previous talent shows. It was only about the voice. It wasn't about the image, what you looked like, how you could dance, because the people selecting the the various um, talents only heard them. That was the unique twist. Um, the spinning chairs, and then they turn around to see what were they listening to. So, killer uh, title. You must also have unique selling points within the format. So, in the voice, the spinning chairs was a a new twist. Um, Something as basic as that. Absolutely. And, and you know, you're not sending people to the moon. You are literally just creating another television vehicle that entertains and informs and has people, you know, giving them a water cooler moment on a Monday morning. Did you see that on Saturday night? And could you believe they did X? You know, if you wander around uh, clubs or sports clubs or dressing rooms or um, colleges, uh, although colleges are closed this time of the year. But if you get onto a bus, I can probably guarantee you that uh, if there's a group of teenagers on the bus, they're probably talking about Love Island. And it's just that thing. That show has captured imagination of a certain cohort of people. um, And the great thing about a great format is it pulls a tribe together. It gives them a common interest. And we all love to share one sort of common interest. So, you know, a killer format will entice people to watch because you've created that can't miss moment, that 
moment that must be shared whilst others are sharing it, while they're talking about it on Twitter. You want to be seeing it and not missing out the next day. So there, these are all the things you need to think about. What's going to give somebody that moment where you just go, oh, oh my God, how fantastic was that? That as usual, you've just given me another thousand questions, but one of them is, you've been at this, what, two deca- decades odd. How many formats, roughly speaking, would you have seen in that period? Would you have seen hundreds or thousands? Thousands. I mean... And do you just look at them at one page and just say, chuck, chuck, chuck? Because a kind of a corollary to that question is, and this is something that I learned over the years, is that many, many of these programs or something very akin to them have been made already. But you can't know everything that's being made down in New Zealand or in Australia or whatever. Well, we do. (laughs) How do you find that out? Because we're constantly looking, constantly watching, reading trades, looking at... um, you know, we subscribe to intelligent services, so we want to know what's new, where is there a way, a different way of doing things, is there a fresher way of doing things. Um, I think one of the things, if, if you want to be a good creative, you can't close your mind. You've got to keep it open. Um, and, you know, I'm a big believer in, in gut instinct, a big believer in, in lady luck. Um, and... You know, people say that such and such a person is very, very lucky. The whole trick about luck is when luck opens the door, you have to gallop through it without a rear view mirror and trust your instincts. Um, And that and that is if something occurs somewhere and we think actually that's a really good idea. What if that idea, if if that notion or that way of shooting the show, um, I mean, formats have grown out of. Uh, technology as well. So shows like One Born Every Minute um, was created because somebody came up with the concept of multi-camera shooting which allowed a hospital have 60 individual cameras installed and record over a period and then they come up with a way of managing the workflow. That workflow and technology created a new way of producing a show. And it's been adopted into, um, you know, uh, schools. It's been adopted into police stations. So there's always a different way of doing something fresh and new. Um, so we're always looking at how can you do that? So we would go to trade shows. We would get pitched new formats. The, you know, many dozens and dozens of distributors will send us their catalogs and their shows so you, you know, you certainly get to look and see an awful lot. Well, what about somebody sitting at home in you know, West Cork or somewhere and who says, I have the new who wants to be a millionaire? You don't really want to hear from them, do you? Well, we, we do want to hear from people. I mean, I, nobody has an exclusivity on a great idea. Uh, and we would be foolish to think that we're the only ones who can do it. Um, what I would say is a, a lot of people think because they have a great idea, and they'll always think their idea is the best. <clears throat> and, I, know, I, know, and, I know that boy. <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and, the, and if they come in and they speak to us, and if we're interested and think the idea has legs, they suddenly start seeing pound signs. Unfortunately, that's not the way it works. If it was only that easy, we would have retired pretty much all of us a long time ago. It doesn't work like that. So trying to manage people's expectations is actually another skill you need because... It doesn't create value straight away. Um, And we may need to partner with a number of people to make that value proposition actually take hold. Um, And then and then it's a shared opportunity, you know, so um, the idea is one thing. The execution is a, a big, big bigger part of it. And one thing Larry Bass of Shinnewill that you understand is commercials. We have to go for a commercial break back right after this. Thinking of travel? If so, make sure to make de facto the world's best shaving oil your choice of travel companion. A 25 milliliter bottle of de facto means no hassle at airports, no bulky cans to carry and the guarantee of the world's best shave. Defactoshave.com 
Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy to use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish owned and a proud member of Team GBS. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. That great business show. And I'm here with Larry Bass of Shinna Will. Larry, did you ever see one get away from you? One that just went global or huge or big anyway that you could have had you for yourself? Mm, where do I start? <laughs> Is that a yes? <laughs> yes. Um you know, we've had ideas which we couldn't really execute um, because, as I said, you know, the, the the number one key to execution is having a customer. When you're based in Ireland where you've literally got a customer, one, um, whilst we have TG Carher and we have Virgin Media, uh, TG Carher's uh, requirement is slightly different to, you know, even a broader broadcaster like RTE. So the, the need for original, new, major formats on a small minority language station is much reduced. Virgin Media would have the same requirement, but it would have much less uh, resource. So they can't um, afford to do as many shows. And an RTE, as a broadcaster, a broadcaster of which their funding has not um, increased for many, many years, um, I think these days it's debt by a thousand cuts. I think um, we are looking at the, um, you know, the the ending of a public service uh, broadcaster by uh, nearly by decree by government from a lack of support and a lack of funding. So year on year, it's got even more difficult for for RT to take risks on shows. They've got schedules they have to fill. They have to fill them with shows that people are definitely going to watch. So the ability to take risks is much reduced. So you add all of that into the landscape for us as the, the mere mortals out there trying to make a new show. Um, you've got a very small window of opportunity. For us, we we need to open up that vista. We need to go global. There is as much an appetite for new ideas anywhere in the world as there is here. You must have read my mind because that is the perfect segue <coughs> because TV, or we won't even call it TV, it's just viewing, it's just transforming. You, as Shinna Will, has open access now to the world, in particular, say, English language speaking world. But then again, we got on to translations as well. The world has become huge for you, if you can crack it. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um the over-the-top platforms, the Netflix, Amazon, Apple, Disney+, Plus, HBO Max, you know, there's a new one every other week. Um, that With form massive of, budgets, massive budgets. Well, some of them do. Um, and then they will apply some of their massive budgets to, you know, pillar programs in their schedules or in their platforms. They don't have schedules. Um, so that that's a whole part of the world that is disappearing. The idea of consuming what you want, when you want, on what you want, it has landed. And uh, I think, you know, you need part of your remit now as a creator is creating something that has a shelf life um, that will be able to be as relevant, you know, uh, months after it's first seen uh, as, as other shows. So the live impact um, element is reducing. It'll never reduce from sport obviously, or from news, um, but certainly other forms of uh, genres, um, that's a real factor. What's wonderful about these new platforms is the renewed appetite for documentaries. And I've seen my own family, uh, you know, my kids, you know, consuming a huge amount more documentaries that frankly they wouldn't have seen if it had been in previous broadcast scenarios because A, uh, for a documentary to make sense, you probably need a very long shelf life and being able to leave it sitting on a platform and people will consume it when they come across it or find out about it or have it referenced. Um, and, and that's the other thing that's changing is how people find 
what they're going to watch. Um, there was a time when you 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 bought the newspaper and you wanted to see what's on TV tonight. <laughs> you know, you you ask um, somebody under the age of twenty what a TV listing is. They look at you with two heads. And I agree with you. And I still look at the back of all of the newspapers and they're still there into the finest and minutest of detail, even though it's all available on a phone or on a screen somewhere as well. But also the programmes um, are increasingly moving to a player of some description yeah. and they will be available by just doing search. You know, so yeah. um, the the real way you're going to find it is is through some, some sort of search. But back to Shinna Will. Because you are going to take advantage of this uh, yeah, in a couple of ways. One thing that you're doing is you're doing dramas, yep. which I didn't know about when I started chatting to you, that you can't big in drama. But also is that you are looking at the world in its entire globe. Yeah, I mean, it, so the beauty about all these um, global platforms is, you know, they want to source the best content from wherever it's coming from. They're not um, defined by only um, getting content in one or two markets. Um, and Netflix has demonstrated that when you look at the success of shows they found in Korea, you know, shows in Spain, some of the biggest performing shows on Netflix have come from anywhere but America. Um, so that gives great comfort and hopefully we will be a uh, supplier to platforms, whether it's Netflix, Amazon or Apple, you know, we will we'll pitch them all. We're currently in the early stages of producing a program for an English company where we're their, their Irish production partner for a show that'll go out on Paramount+. Plus. What does that mean now? What, what will you be doing for them? So it's a drama series that, um, called Doll Factory. Um, it's based on a, a hit novel, a uh, period piece, and we will be the Irish um, service producer for a show that'll shoot here, and then obviously it'll be seen around the world on Paramount+. Plus. Why would it shoot here? Because I see more and more vast amounts of money going into stages in the UK. And I, I know that we are putting more money. In fact, today I saw, was it Mullingar? It's going yep. to have a TV centre as well. That's on top of two in Wicklow, one in Limerick, one in Galway, am I right? I mean, yeah, there's two in Galway now. Two in Galway. Um, and, you know, the Paul Chesney's one in Mullingar, um, MBS, who have bought Ardmore Studio in Bray and Troy Studio in Limerick are building another one in Greystones. Um, Ashford Studios are also looking at doubling their studio space in Ashford and Wicklow, where they are the home of Valhalla, which is the Netflix show which followed on from Vikings. Um, there's also a uh, planning commission for a studio in Clonmel. James Morris and Alan Maloney are looking at building a studio in Grange Castle in West Dublin. Um, and I know there's another one uh, planning is applied for for a studio in near Gorey in County Wexford. Um, there's one um, in uh, early stage development in Cork. And Shinnewill opened up a studio with a company called Reverest in Font Hill in Dublin last year. It's a single studio, so we, we're not harbouring the same ambitions as the multi-stage studios that the big studios are building. Um, but we certainly opened ours because there was no studio space available for couple of shows we wanted to do. So Last Singer Standing was the first show in that studio. We did Dancing with the Stars there last year. Um, but uh, other companies, uh, there was a Liam Neeson movie shot there before last Christmas. Um, the Fox show from uh, America, the American version of Name That Tune was produced there by uh, an Irish company called Bigger Stage. Um, and a bunch of other shows have gone into that single studio, which is not even open a year. So the studio business is going to explode in Ireland. But explode in which way? Because like, there is a huge competition. Yeah, but I, I, I've, I've been saying this for, for many, many years. There is a significant cultural dividend for Ireland. We just have to go and take it. And the opportunity is there. And it, we can walk, look at it passing us by, but we can go and take it. Explain. Um, the, the, you know, one of the fastest growing industries in the world is the entertainment world. Um, it is recession proof. Um, it is second only to the arms industry. And uh, Ireland uh, has one of the unique track records in the world. We were exporting story, narrative, literature before we ever had a country. It's in our nature. We are storytellers. So we can become absolute experts when it comes to the making of TV drama, feature film, animation, 
and crafted documentaries. It's what we do. It's in our DNA. We now just need to elevate our scale uh, to match the requirements of these significant global platforms who want quality. That's the key thing. They don't want cheap and cheerful. They want quality high end. And if it's not going to be cheap, it's going to cost, which means funding. Where does that leave Shinawil and others in terms of funding? Well, Shinawil, um, we have been lucky. We've managed to self-fund everything we've done to date. Um, but we are at a crossroads in terms of where the business is. So I'm out there now um, looking to bring in investment to scale the business. We want to look at um, doing more originating of more content here in Ireland. We're talking to other you know, investment partners on the origination side of uh, non-scripted formats like the aforementioned MasterChef and Dancing with the Stars, etc. Um, but also on the scripted side, we want to create more TV drama series. That means going after the rights to books and other IP that exist um, and having the resources to hire writers to write. Um, Have and we got good writers here as a matter of interest? This country is teeming with writing talent. Um, but what, but what we for need TV to, or for movies? Well, that's, that's the thing. What we need to do is take some of our writing talent and um, shepherd them into the different uh, genre that is writing for a screen. So you move them from writing from a novel to writing a screenplay. They are different. Even the adapting of a screen of a novel into a screenplay is a particular skill. Um, and then some people need to understand the discipline for writing for TV screen as opposed to feature film. With feature film, you can have budgets that have no end, and you can literally write the most details, you know, novel and the most detailed story. And if somebody has enough money, they can go off and make it. TV is a little bit more defined. TV will require uh, you to be able to write to particular parameters. Um, you, you, you know, you can't afford to have a cast of thousands in every episode. Uh, you can't afford to have, you know, special effects uh, that cost, you know, multi-millions all the time in every sequence. So you've got to write to a particular discipline and a particular genre. Um, and I think we are looking forward to bringing more writers into that discipline, taking existing writers and 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 have them work with uh, fantastically skilled writers who are out there. And believe it or not, Ireland's a nice place for people to come, spend time. So you bring a, a skilled writer into a writer's room, they could suddenly train up, you know, five or six or eight writers in a writer's room. You know, and they only need a couple of uh, experiences like that to be able to become in their own right, uh, the writer who can then lead uh, a new story. So it doesn't take long to scale up. We need to scale up other skills as well. We need lots more um, producers, lots more production accountants, a huge amount more of the camera skills we need, production uh, design, um, costume design, um, actors, actresses, um, you know, we literally, it's a, this is a, a huge opportunity for Ireland Inc. And it won't be all centred in Dublin. Shinawil needs funding. You've just said so. How much? <laughs> we're, we're looking, we're in a multi-million fundraise at the moment. Uh, we've got big ambitions. Um, we've been successful here, but we need to open up another front's. Um, we want to open in the UK. A lot of people are going post-Brexit, going away from the UK. The reason why I want to go into the belly of the beast is the single best television um, industry in the world is in the UK. They are the best um, and we want to be there uh, competing with the best. Um, so I've already targeted who I want to hire. So I know who I want to hire um, and have Shinawil in, in, in the UK. Well, give me give me the the pitch. One euro, one pound sterling in will pay back how much? We would we would see a you know a four to ten times multiple earning after five years. That's all right. I'm look at it's better than Bank of Ireland, I can tell you. Yeah. Um but we do need like it as I said, it's a multiple million pounds investment. We want to add other facilities into our own facility. Um, and have our, an ability to do a lot more within the, the, the banner of Shinawil. We're working with a fantastic Canadian company at the moment, Incendo, who are owned by uh, very, very big um, French-Canadian uh, uh, broadcaster. And the facilities they have are, you know, 
unbelievable and there's no reason why uh, a facility like that can't exist in Ireland. Um, and we also want to double down on our first employee in LA and build a development team there and start pitching not just from here to there, but pitch from there to there. If somebody gives you a big chunk of money, can they star in one of your productions? <laughs> um, you know, again, you, there's there's one common denominator in everything that will have a Shinna Will logo at the end, and that's quality. So if that person who wants to uh, star in something can do it with, very well with plum and keep the quality up, yes is the answer. <laughs> and if you give you enough money, I'd say yes and yes. Final question. As always, we ask all our guests, who would Larry Bass, founder of Shinna Will, hire in a heartbeat? Oh God, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to have a few. Um you know, I, I think what we would really like to do is work with some of the biggest and most successful writers in the world. So, um, you know, Stephen Knight is a fantastic writer and creator. Um, famously, he's done Peaky Blinders for BBC. Um, so to have writing talent like that working with us, um, you know, Sally Rooney, Lenny Abrams, um, who did uh, Normal People, um, you know, Lenny and Adam is, and Paul. Never forget Adam and no, Paul that was is one of the best. Brilliant. Really great. Um, and so Lenny is a fantastic talent. Um, Lenny works um, so much with Element. Element have gone on such a huge growth, um, fantastic company. Um, you know, because they, uh, you know, from the get-go, wanted to invest in talent, work with talent, give talent a, a shop window. Um, we want to start doing the same. Um, we're new to the scripted side of defence but we're absolutely determined to work with the very best uh, and give them an even bigger platform. Um, we want um, all of the talent we work with to have the ambition, the same as us, that what they're working on will be seen by a global audience. Um, and that changes your outlook. Um, we want people to have that ambition. Um, frankly, if you don't, you're not going to be able to write to the level that we want. Anybody and everybody in every business that comes on to that great business show, we always want them to have that global ambition because we're tiny. We are, what is it, a couple of million people and there's eight to but billion. But we punch way above our weight. Um, and, you know, we've had fantastic success in Ireland with music, which is, again, punch way above its weight around the world. Dance, um, you know, feature film has always had a, you know, reasonably good success rate. It's really time for us to grow up now and start exporting television. Love to see it. Larry Bass, founder of Shinwill, thank you for joining us. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy to use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Viscosity. When you shave, you want the highest viscosity because it helps the blade run smoother. De facto, the world's best shaving oil has incredible viscosity. That's why De facto leaves your face, underarms, or legs nick free. Higher viscosity makes blades last longer. De facto is the best for your skin and your pocket. DeFactoShave.com. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. Business watchers will recognise the name Pino Harris, a man who dominated truck sales in this country until his death five years ago. The Harris Group, that imports brands like Iveco and Isuzu, is now run by Pino Harris's widow Denise, aided by a general manager, Mark Barrett. Significantly in 2015, the group secured the distribution rights for a Chinese brand called Maxis. Maxis is actually owned by the same company that makes MG Cars. The Harris Group has distribution rights for Maxis in the UK, Ireland, the Channel Islands, the Isle of Man, Malta and Cyprus. And they have taken the UK by storm and now have 11% of electric light commercial vehicles, or we'll be calling them LCVs, business there. And they're hoping to grow that by another 400% this year. So, with supply chain problems, sanctions, Brexit, you know, the usual business problems, how are they managing that? 
Mark Barnett, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thank you very much, Colin. It's a pleasure to be here today. My first podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it hopefully will not be your last. Hopefully. <laughs> so, the Maxis brand, first of all, is a curious one. Where did you find it? How did you come across it? I'm always interested. Now, your business, the Harrow business, lives in the upper echelons of business. You have an, an international business. So, there is recognition there. So, you didn't actually just walk in the door and say, we're here. How did you find and get and secure the Maxis brand? It started off back in 1994 uh, when we're losing out on, on, on the trooper. Sorry, 2004. Apologies. On the trooper. So we looked at, at a replacement for that. So, no, sorry. When you lost out on the trooper. As in the Isuzu trooper was uh, no longer in production. Okay. So at the time, Pino wanted a replacement Jeep SUV. So he looked to the east and he said China is the up and coming place to be. Done a trade mission. Uh, unfortunately, visited many manufacturers back then, and they were all producing kind of the same Jeep or SUV, which is a copy of one another. So, decided to scrap that for a number of years. And then during the recession in 2010, gave us time to start looking again and focusing on new products. So, we went to China in 2010. We visited the Beijing Auto Show the following year, Shanghai. And every year we kept going back. We've seen development progress that the manufacturers became more unique in their own design, their styling, everything like that. So in 2015, Pino opened the commercial motor magazine one day and seen that Psych, SEIC, had just recently acquired LDV and they were planning to relaunch it back into Europe. So he just put an X on the page on the commercial motor magazine. He called in... Um, his friend at the time and Vice President, Liam O'Neill, say, Liam, he said, I want that. Go to China and get me the franchise. He is a man I never met, Pino Harris. He obviously was a real player. He was a remarkable man. He was ahead of his time as regards electrification. He said, electric is the future. And that's going back seven years ago, eight years ago. And he was right. Yes, he was bang on. Because one of the things that Maxis is bringing is light commercial vehicles with electric motors, correct? Correct. And that is a huge growth area. We started our first launch in 2016 with the LDV EV80 van. Um, you know that normally on these podcasts I kill people because they talk in acronyms, but I know that you get... The EV part is electric vehicle. Yes. The LDV, what did I say? Light... Uh, it's no, LCV, is it? L LDV used to be Leyland DAF vehicles. Oh, okay. So the brand was actually called LDV, so it's not an argument. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so we launched uh, the EV80 in the commercial vehicle show Birmingham in 2016. Um, at that time... Now, when uh, you say we, this as is in Harris, Harris Group, Group. Harris Group. But you then were representing Maxis or the company that owned yes, Maxis. Yes, so at yeah. the time we had, the, the brand was LDV at the time, which is okay. the older platform. And they are allowed you to launch it in Birmingham, yeah? We secured the distribution rights in 2015. So our first product to market, our first launch platform was in City West in January of 16 for, for the Irish market. And then for the UK market, we launched at the CV show, commercial vehicle show in Birmingham. And what did you have that they allowed you to distribute in the UK? But you know, you are big in a very small market, being Ireland. They, they like the fact that we're, we're a family business. Um, believe it or not, the sense of humour between the Irish and the Chinese is very similar. We like to, to walk before we start running. Um, they liked our, our plan as regards route to market, that we, we, we gently increase our market share. We build, develop our dealer network as the brand is growing as well. So Gently increase the market share. What did I say at my intro? That this year you may hit 400% increase? Yeah, it's gentle. <laughs> <laughs> that is phenomenal. It is. It is remarkable. Yeah. And how do you handle that? Um, like I mentioned, well, Brexit. You probably Brexit probably doesn't interfere with it because you're bringing these in from... So where are they made, actually? They're made in a place called Wuxi, which is just north of Shanghai, China. I always laugh when people say, oh, it's Wuxi. Like five years ago, did you know where Wuxi was? Just up the road. <laughs> <laughs> Man, <laughs> But there was there's Brexit. There is um, so, you know the sanctions, and there are difficulties in importation from China, and we also the with chain supply problems. We've we've had many challenges. Brexit was the first one, but thankfully we had approximately two years to prepare for Brexit. And what did you do? We looked at importing directly into the UK, 
Uh, otherwise, we're looking at double tariffs. So we used to bring the vehicles all into Dublin. We'd PDI them in our, in our own headquarters on the Mays Road. Pre-delivery inspection. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so we get the vehicles prepared for the dealers on our Nace Road facility and then we would then deliver them straight from there to the dealer, whether the dealer was in Scotland, Cork, Cornwall. Because there were no borders, so it didn't matter. Didn't matter. Okay. Post-Brexit. So when Brexit was announced, what was the mood in Camp Pino Harris or Camp Harris? Panic stations for an hour. Oh, an hour. Okay. An hour. Go on. Okay. <laughs> what's what's going what's gonna to happen? We knew it wasn't going to happen overnight. So we had time to prepare. We have our logistics partner, which is NVD, uh, Irish company. So NVD already had operations within the UK. So we said, okay, we'll now bring the vehicles directly from Shanghai straight into Bristol Port or Southampton Port. And how do they travel? Do they travel in containers or on huge, big transport ships? Or When we started at the very start, and when shipping was at a normal price and a rate and stuff, we used to bring it in by container. So you used to have two vans per 40-foot container. Okay. Um, with post-COVID, every bit of PPE equipment was coming from China all around the world. Shipping became a serious problem. Um, container shortages. So we had to and change. And container prices. And prices. So we had to change to roll on, roll off, which is called roll row. Okay. So you roll row. Well, you don't have to <laughs> row, fortunately for you. But you roll row China to UK. To UK. So Southampton, uh, now Bristol, and then directly into Dublin Port as well. So the same ship brings them into Dublin Port or? There are some direct routes. So you're looking at some direct routes into Bristol. Uh, depends on the shipping line. Others are trans-shipped via Zeeburger, and that goes into Dublin Port or into Southampton or Bristol. And you have, as I mentioned earlier, been very, very successful in the UK. What are you doing right? Um, first of all, we listen to the customers. Um, that seems to be a theme, is bad businesses don't listen to people, good have, businesses yeah, do. Yeah, customers are the experts. And who taught you that? Was it that Pino Harris? Um, it's a bit of both, yeah. Pino Harris and just looking at the at the the new world we're in with electric vehicles uh, and getting an understanding of it. Um, the first, I suppose, the first vehicle we brought in, we had no charger on site, so we had to go to Super Value and Luke, and was the nearest uh, rapid charger. Um, and believe it or not, standing at the charge station talking to EV owners was the best education I got. Um, by any means for, for, for vehicles and stuff. Does Super Value know that you're using their electricity? It was free at the time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that as a no. Super Value, <laughs> Pino Harris, private company, can afford to pay you back for your electricity. Yeah. We, we use it as just for R&D, just research. <laughs> <laughs> so then, okay, you get your first vehicles in, then what happens? So we, we now look at, we speak to a customer, we say, okay, you want an electric vehicle, what do you do as a business? So we, we need to understand, or our dealers need to understand what the customer needs the vehicle to do. So first of all, we identify, yes, electric vehicle is suitable for your application or it's not. And we insist on telling the dealers, if you feel it's not suitable, please don't push an electric vehicle on a customer. And that. So we identify if it's right, happy days, we tick that box. Then we look at the next phase of it is, what type of charging do you need? Do you need to have a very fast charger or do you need to have just a standard on a single phase charger? So we identify that. And then if we say, okay, you need a fast charger, we then look at the infrastructure you have, whether you have three phase on site for electricity to, to, to cope with the demand on your charger. So unless we tick all three boxes, we don't proceed uh, with the sale. Now, as some listeners will know, I take a huge interest in matters of vehicles and cars and all. And I do know that things electric are moving at such a pace. Yes. So every time that you put an order in with China, it still takes weeks, at least, maybe months, to get from A to B. And by that time, one of the things that, for example, has disappeared is the so-called range anxiety. People are not concerned about the range anymore. What is happening in the commercial vehicle, the ones that the Maxxis, if I can call them that, the Maxxis brand uh, vehicles that you're talking about at the moment, just in terms of range, because they will be out of date? Um, not necessarily. Um, if you have a van that does your 190 kilometres today um, and in four years' time it's still the cleanest van in the marketplace and it does 180 kilometres, for example, it, it's still it's still there with, with, with new product. 
Um, I was looking at a, a, a Mercedes uh, in the newspapers. <laughs> I hasten to add, yesterday they're up at seven hundred and thirty, I think, kilometers in range. Now that is a car. I appreciate that, but big difference between one hundred and ninety kilometers and seven hundred and thirty kilometers. And I think I read somewhere that the thousand kilometer is coming as well. We will see that, but I mean, it's the same. I think it's more the charge and speed is more important than the actual overall range. You have a car that will do. 700 kilometres to a tank, we can put a bigger tank in that and give you 2,000 kilometres. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll fill the car. So I think the most important is actually the speed of charge. And there's a fine balance then between payload and and range. So I was warned not to mention charging to you because that gets you going a bit. It does a small bit, yeah. But Why? Um, I feel there's, there's just a need uh, here, especially in Ireland, to really concentrate on the infrastructure. Whose job is that? Should that not be maybe the motor man of distributors? Because you're selling and you want maybe the government to put in charging points or whose job is it to put in the charging points? I suppose if you look back at a nice maybe en- it's super value. <laughs> <laughs> if you look back at a nice engine, I mean, you don't, you don't see other manufacturers selling ice, ice is, is in com- <laughs> internal combustion <laughs> engine. So whether it's diesel we or electric. We only charge 20 euro. At this stage, you may as well take out your checkbook if you have one. You probably don't. Anyway, <laughs> go back to the charging and who's who should be charging? Who should be putting that in? Um, it's the same as a filling station. Yeah. You, when, when, when I, you, we had Brian Donaldson of Maxell on the podcast as well. And yeah, they're going to have charging, but I can see a problem for him is that the charging is getting more and more rapid. So every time that you put in a charging point, it could be obsolete. Um, it's the fine balance of, of rapid charging. You can put in a 350 kilowatt uh, rapid charger, but you may have a vehicle that will only accept... 30 kilowatts. Um, but we've noticed, especially in the UK in the last 12 months, that the infrastructure has improved tenfold. And who has done that? That's been done by a mixture of, of private, but also government as well. So local authorities. And why or should the Irish local authorities or is it the Irish government should be doing this? We have an agenda to go green. Um, mm-hmm. Everyone has to play their part. So us as a manufacturer or distributor... We're playing our part by bringing in new technology, new electric vehicles, cleaner vehicles into the marketplace. I'd say that some people in government might start arguing, well, they're your cars, you charge them. I mean, we, we have had manufacturers for years and distributors, but they didn't have filling stations. Yeah, but you also, there, there was a commercial opportunity there for the filling stations because they don't own cars and they will sell you overpriced popcorn or overpriced chocolates or whatever to make their margin. What's the future? What are you thinking of when you look at the chargers and the future for charging? I think there's going to be a combination of your newer type services on the motorway. So if you're heading to... Sorry, well, ser- what, what, uh, what ser- no, no, what services on the motorway? Do you remember this one as well? <laughs> I was down in Clock Jordan uh, last weekend trying to find a service station. The, yes, you get one in Money Goal, you know, the famous yes. Barack Obama. There were some clever engineers who said we shouldn't have service stations on the motorway. So, what I mean, that's where, where it has to be. Um, and you take, let's say, in the UK, you've got a company called GridServe. So, they've got a whole new concept of, of, of services, which is approximately 40 to 50 chargers, um, all within the one site. You have a coffee shop, you've got a gym, you've got private offices you could rent if you want to sit and just do have a meeting. Um to relaxation lounges, etc. So it's it's we're changing, we're adapting with the time. So I've not heard nor seen this grid serve. This is all lovely because I'm now learning again. Is it like it's like your Maxall station, except it's called Grid Serve and it does everything except well, I don't I didn't see a gym in Maxall yet. <laughs> <laughs> it does everything bar sell um, petrol and, or diesel, and they are on the motorways. Are they? They're on the motorways, so they're rolling out faster in the, within the UK, and similar will happen here. And do we know who owns Grid Serve? Maybe you don't, but uh, just out of curiosity, it's a privately owned company. And you pull in, and where is the payment? So you pull in, you go to the charge point. You you have your charge card. Uh, you tap it on the on the display, plug it in, and that's it. Okay, charge so, away. But you but. Are we paying full commercial electricity charges or costs or what's the... the it, is, it is approximately 40% more than what it would cost you plugging it in at your home. 
Well, that's, their, that's where their margin that is. That is their, where their margin is. Okay. But it's the convenience and it's the speed of charge as well. So you can plug in for 20 minutes and get up to 80% charge. Well, that's fantastic, isn't it? That's While the, you get, up, get your cup of coffee or run the treadmill. Because, <laughs> okay, well, we'll pass on the treadmill. <laughs> that kind of, it's, it's almost like somebody a likes being on a treadmill and he says, we'll stick one of those in there, great idea. Yeah. Nobody will use it. It's quirky. They'll, they'll yeah. be coming out again. The, the future, though, is, there's a lot of talk about this, is hydrogen. Is that we will, be, because hydrogen is free, hydrogen is in the air, and we can crack it, in on the sea, put into bottles basically, and then stick it into a vehicle. That could surpass electricity quicker than we think. We have a lot of mixed thoughts on hydrogen versus electric, and the problem with hydrogen is at the moment is 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 the cost of producing hydrogen um, and storing it. You look at uh, hydrogen at similar price if you were filling your car with diesel or petrol. Where if you look at electric at the moment, you're looking at seventy percent less. So if you look at a cost, on an average cost per kilometre, you're looking at approximately six to seven cents for a, an EV van. So obviously it's going to be less for an EV car. Versus a diesel van and equivalent, you're up to maybe 20, 22 cent per kilometre. But I presume it's early days for hydrogen and as usual, more people use it, prices drop and uh, it becomes neck and neck with elect- electricity. The challenge with hydrogen is the infrastructure. Um, long term, yes, it will come in. And what do you call long term? Because just imagine how quickly electricity is just transformed. Um, my own opinion, and this yeah. is just, just mine. That's what and, we want. And I'll probably get slated <laughs> for this. I, I think 10 years. Okay. Uh, I think 10 years is when, when hydrogen will come in. And it'll come in certainly for the heavier commercial vehicles, the likes of your 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 articulated trucks where they're on long haul. Um you'll have a mixture of both. There's no one silver bullet for all of this. It's going to be a combination of hydrogen and pure electric. Or Zoom calls. Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> they should be called COVID calls. Well, maybe they are. Okay, so what's the future there for? And sorry, I have to go back to um, the Harris uh, Group business because you, not alone are you in the UK and Ireland, but I did say that you have managed to get into Malta and to Cyprus, the Isle of Man, Channel Islands. Now, I do see a common thread the English language. Are you being held back by not? Uh, the common the, thread is not the English language. Is it's, it go it's, on? What it's, is it? It's the right-hand drive. Ah! Is there any chance at all that that will ever change, that the EU will tell us to change over? Now, what happened in the UK because they're, they've got away from that. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I doubt it. I doubt it. I mean, because if you look at, at who's right-hand drive, it's all islands. So... You know, it, there's no, it's not different if you're driving through France to Italy and you're switching from left to right. They're Ireland, uh, Ireland, Malta, Cyprus are all small islands, so. But could you not do, a, do you remember this other thing that you mentioned, P-D-I, your pre- pre-delivery pre- inspection? inspection? Could you not do one of those and switch from right to left or left to right? It's not as simple as that. Is it not? No, unfortunately, because behind your your underneath your windscreen, behind your dash, you've got components like your brake server, etc. So there's a lot of re-engineering to switch to steering from left so to right. it doesn't sound like you're going to take on mainland Europe, are you? No, we're not greedy. Oh. We're happy enough with the seven districts we have. And how quickly, like if you're going to do, I mean, are you really going to do a 400% increase in the UK this year? If we get the products in that we've been promised from the factory, uh, yes. Now, you, there's a kind of a question mark in that. It's all down to shipping at the moment. Yeah, and it's still a curse, isn't it? We have approximately 6,500 vehicles on back order. Oh, which my, this says, you have, the Harris Group has? Yes, of which the factory have said that they will be supplying us before the end of the year. Now, hang on a second, I'm sitting down, 6,500 vehicles, valued each vehicle. I'm just doing me sums here. Well, a lot. Wait, are they 100,000 each? No, no, they're not. 50,000? Less. Okay, higher, higher, lower, lower. You know, uh, That's a lot. Of cash tied up somewhere. It's 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 not all at once. So obviously we yeah, get timing yeah. right and month every yeah. month stock in, stock out. But that's big. It is big. Yeah. And it's a big commitment for us and that's you know uh, how passionate we are about the job. So we, like you obviously make phone calls every day or you do something every day to find out where are my dot 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 vehicles. The morning starts at approximately four o'clock if I wake up. <laughs> Check my phone, <laughs> small rant to China if needs be, <laughs> and then back to sleep for a couple of hours. Um, but we have we have weekly calls with the factory uh, over production. 
And, and what's, uh, what's holding up the production? Is it they it, can't get parts? Or? It's it's a mixture of component shortages, like the of the the chips, um, like you have in your electronics shortages. Uh, we've seen Shanghai with with lockdown due to COVID, uh, and other cities in Shanghai or in, in China. And then the factory then reopened in Wuxi, and unfortunately, some of the component suppliers are still in Shanghai when lockdown. So it's a combination of everything. And then there's a backlog of ships then at the port. So, As they say, that be business. Come here to me. Final question to you. Who would you hire in a heartbeat? Who would I hire in a heartbeat? Now, you were warned of this, I hope. I was. <laughs> well, <I've> <laughs> you were think, looking I've, at me. I've been thinking. <laughs> uh, business is serious. Uh, you know, we, we take it serious every day, but everyone needs a laugh. Kevin Bridges. Oh, he is fantastic. Yes. If you can understand him. <laughs> it's easy. I deal with dealers from, from Northern yeah. Ireland to, to Cork. He is just so funny. Yeah. And the way he can keep going forever. Yeah, he's on he's on Team GBS now. I'd love to have him yeah. on as well. Fantastic choice, yeah. Listen, will you come back into us when you solve all the problems of uh, distribution from China and uh, when the um, hydrogen vehicles are arriving? Because that will be sooner than 10 years, I'm telling you. The infrastructure will be ready in 10, but the vehicles will be here beforehand. Well, they won't be doing very much if, not, if there's no infrastructure. <laughs> when, when infrastructure you might be looking at them matured, on the long mile road. matured enough for, for a national <laughs> rollout, but there will be trials, I'd say, within the next four years. Hmm. That is Mark Barrett of the Harris Group, isn't that? Uh, Harris, Harris Group, Group, Harris yeah. Maxes, all part of the one family. And if anybody wants to buy a Maxis, they'll find you at psychmaxes.co.uk or psychmaxes.ie. Maxus, M-A-X-U-S, is the brand to look out for. Mark, thanks you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. That Great Business Show. And that is it from That Great Business Show, episode 97. At this point, I normally ask you to share, share, share the podcast with your pals. But today I want to thank, thank, thank you for doing so in your hundreds. Here's a handy hint. Drop the link to the podcast into WhatsApp and while you're watching TV or whatever, just send the link on to your friends and family, those who would love to know all about great business insights that we give you every week. Those pals will love, love, love you for it. Advertise with us. Great companies like Big Red Cloud, Microfinance Ireland and Virgin Media do have your business support what our listeners call Ireland's best business podcast. We record here at the Dublin South Podcast Studios where sound engineer Brian Begley and studio manager Peter Rice make us sound like angels or business angels at the very least. If you want to record a podcast, do use the team here at the Dublin South Podcast Studios. They are great, I say so. And if you'd like the media group to produce a podcast for your business, then talk to me, Connell O'Moran. Find me on LinkedIn. All our great business insights and tips are brought to you, as always, thanks to our sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil, the world's best all-natural shaving oil. They back us, please back them. DeFactoShave.com will get them. And of course, don't forget to buy Business Plus magazine, who will now have a regular column all about the podcast. So from me, Conal O'Moran, meet up by us for listening. Slán Tommy.